Um, so a very warm welcome from our side, from Katrin Amunds and me, um, to this anatomy course. And the idea of the course is um, to provide you with some information about first the gross anatomy and then showing you a little more details in terms of microstructure, the link, how you can see that through the MRI maybe, at least parts of it, for you to hopefully better understand in the end why anatomy is still important even in 2018, although anatomy is quite an old uh, part of science and that we think that you should always come back to the anatomy when you interpret your MRI results. So it's my pleasure to start um, this round. We have five talks today. And um, the first talk will be about um, the gross anatomy and about particularly the landmarks within the brain. And um, I would like to just start with a quick overview about the brain surface. And if you take a look at it, you see that obviously it is really folded. If you take a look from the um, lateral view and from the top view, and the most important thing about it is, obviously, it looks quite confusing, but in general, this principle applies to all brains in all humans. Still, the question is, if, the, if it applies to all humans, do we have a chance to find any general organizational principle, despite the fact that we are all individuals and that all of us have quite distinct folding patterns and individual anatomy? And this overall organizational principle should be the guiding uh, path through this course. All the other speakers will tell you basically the same idea. And um, I would like to start showing you a little more about the general landmarks of these overall organizational principles. All right, so if you try to orient yourself on the brain surface, it might be easier if you just inflate it a little bit. Obviously, that is not possible in a living human brain, but MRI is a nice technique to do that, and you can just inflate the surface and try to identify the most common and obvious sulci in the brain. And if you do that, you obviously see something which is here in the middle, which is oriented, the only thing actually in the human brain, which is oriented from dorsal to ventral, this part, which would be our central sulcus region. And so if you try to label these guys, you will see basically three sulci and in the middle two main gyri, and these would be in the middle the central sulcus surrounded by the pre- and post-central sulcus, and then in between, obviously, you would have the pre- and post-central gyrus. All the other sulci are mainly oriented from rostral to caudal in the brain, trying to start here in the frontal lobe, for example, the major sulci that you always see, that are always present, at least mainly, some of them in, in some brains, they are a little interrupted, but you typically can see them, are those guys here. So these would be the superior and inferior frontal sulci. If you then go a little further to the back, you see a same or a similarly oriented sulcus in the parietal lobe in here. It's only one, and it's even heavier to see typically in human brains because it's more interrupted as compared to the frontal lobe. This would be the interparietal sulcus then. And on the temporal aspect, you see obviously the most prominent fissure in our brain, the lateral fissure, and then the two main sulci within the temporal lobe, which will be the superior and inferior temporal sulcus. If you keep that in mind, then you have already a quite good assumption of where you are, and everything else, everything which is going on here in these little gyri, and if you just go back to the original surface, you would see that they are heavily folded, are more inter-individually variable as compared to those very large sulci. Those are evolving quite early during um, ontogeny and during development. The others are coming later on, so in the hierarchy they would be secondary or tertiary sulci, and thus it, they are more variable across individuals. All right, so now I would like to show you a little examples of where exactly are these different sulci and how you can find them if you use MRI, because obviously you not always have the surface view available, but typically you are looking on sections. And the question is, is it easy to see some of those sulci at least already in sections, and how does that relate 
to some functional organizational principles of the brain, which would obviously be a good idea if you can already see on these images a hint on where you are and where in which functional system you might be. And I would like to start with the most prominent region, this central sulcus region in here. If we take a look from the side, from the lateral right aspect, it would be this region. From the top view, it's a little more difficult, but I hope after these few slides about it, you will have a better idea of where it is. It is this region in here. The central sulcus is this large one over here. And the first sign that you can apply is the so-called hook sign. And all these signs that I'm now showing you are coming from radiolo radiological um, investigations where people found these so-called signs to orient themselves within these images. What is the hook sign? If you try to identify the central sulcus in a sagittal brain section, and this is how such a sagittal brain section might look like, you would see it's approximately the same orientation as this one. You cut like this through the brain on the side, so it's not in the middle, but somewhere, for example, here within the right hemisphere. Please take a look at this particular figure here. You see a large uh, elongated uh, gyrus over here and this little clustered figure over here. And if you try to imagine a little bit, it looks like a hook which is holding a little ball or something in front of it, like this, right? So here would be the hook and there is something being in this hook. This is the hook sign and this is always shows you, it, it actually it looks like that in 90-95% of the subjects, you see this sign and the sulcus in between is the central sulcus. So if you see such a thing in a sagittal brain section, you are quite sure that you are in the central sulcus region. This for the sagittal view. There is another thing that you can use to identify the central sulcus and this is from the mesial side. I will show you in a minute, I go, go back a little bit, but first to show you the, the view of the mesial hemisphere. So if we try to look here, it's a um, almost mesial view onto the right hemisphere. Here would be the front, here the back. And now we try to look at this particular region. You now see here the corpus callosum. On top of the corpus callosum would be the singular gyrus. And then a large sulcus appears, this one here. And this sulcus is the cingulate sulcus, and this one helps you to identify the central sulcus. Why? Because here you have a very prominent upper branch of the cingulate sulcus. It's called the marginal branch. And this guy is always going from the cingulate sulcus to the dorsal part of the brain, right here. And it always is directly neighboring the central sulcus. The next sulcus right in front of this marginal branch is always the central sulcus, this little guy here. From the mesial side, it's not that easy to identify the central sulcus because the major part is on the lateral surface, obviously. But on the mesial side, you can easily see it because it's always in front of this marginal branch of the cingulate sulcus and is typically bended a little bit to the back. I hope you can at least imagine it that it goes a little bit to the back of the brain. So if we now go back on this slide, here we were in the central sulcus region, and here is the part where this back-banded central sulcus goes into the mesial hemisphere, and these guys here over here, these two little thingies on both sides, are the upper parts of the marginal branch of the cingulate sulcus. So you can at least see it already on the surface that they are very close together. So these also help you here. And the question is, why is it so interesting to see or to identify the central sulcus in such regions? Because the central sulcus region is our motor and somotor sensory region in the brain. We do have, if we take a look from the top again, here the post-central sulcus, uh, the post-central gyrus and the pre-central gyrus on both sides. And you have there the motor system and the somatosensory system. If you try to visualize that a little bit, you have these little homunculi 
those guys showing you which parts of our body are represented where in the brain. And it just shows you that some parts are obviously quite heavily represented, our hands, the mouth region, for example, in both. And some are not that well represented because they're not so important for our fine-grained tuning of our muscles and our senses. And all over this central sulcus region, the pre- and post-central gyrus, these guys are in a somatotopical fashion organized. So if you take a look at a coronal section through the central sulcus region, you see these guys somehow overlaid on the surface. Here would be the mesial surface, here are the lateral parts, and you see that, for example, this hand region is located on the lateral surface, but more on the dorsal view. And if you try to localize that here on the surface view, you would, for example, you try to imagine here's the mesial part. Here we would start with the foot and the legs, then the body part comes, and then this large hand region would be approximately here. And this is the interesting part, because we cannot only identify the central sulcus itself, but we can already on a brain section without any functional imaging identify this hand region. Why? If we take again a section, in this case a transversal brain section through the brain, you see here would be front, here would be back, this part over here on both sides, these guys, and what we are now looking for is a Greek letter. It's the omega. And this is why it's called the omega sign. So we are looking for a figure which looks a bit like that. And if we try to localize that within our brain section, you hopefully can see that it's somewhere there. Yeah? This guy over here on both sides. So it looks a little bit like an omega. And this omega sign gives you the approximate location of the hand region already. So we are within the central sulcus, and we are already down to a functional unit. This is the hand region. It has been shown in functional imaging studies that the hand region is typically located over here. Now you can just localize it based on the macroanatomy. The funny thing is that Although we would like to talk about the central sulcus, I'm coming back to that again in a second, I would like to show you that these guys here, something which looks like an omega, is also visual, visible in another part of the brain, but it is obviously not the hand region of the somatosensory system. If we zoom in here from the lateral view, here is the central sulcus again, here would be the hand region, this part. If we go in and zoom into the lateral fissure this time, and we try to identify it here on the sagittal view and here on the bottom on a coronal view, like this. I hope you can see that there is something which looks a little bit like the omega. Please try to look at this guy over here and these small guys down here. They look a little the same, but obviously we are not in the central sulcus anymore. We are somewhere in the lateral fissure, and the lateral fissure contains one large gyrus, which is on top of it, and on top of the superior temporal gyrus. This is Heschel's gyrus. And Heschel's gyrus is just sitting on top here, and it's not called the omega sign. That would be too easy. It's called the mushroom sign, because it looks like a mushroom popping out of the um, superior temporal gyrus. You see the same here. So looking a little bit like that, but at another place in the brain. It's not that easy, actually, if you take a look at the transversal brain section. On a transversal brain section, it is not the mushroom sign because it's not popping up. The Heschel gyrus is almost the same orientation as the temporal lobe, so a little like to the front and a little to uh, frontoventral orientation. So if you take a look at a transversal brain section, you would see something like an elongated sausage or something like that. Actually, people call it the sausage sign. So just for you to convince you, here would be a view from the top onto the temporal lobe. Here would be the temporal lobe. All the rest is um, taken apart, take, taken away, so to, you just can see the temporal lobe. And here on top would be Heschel's gyrus. That is what you see in these images. <laughs> 
Why is it important? Because Heschel's gyrus also contains a functional region and it contains another sensory region, the auditory cortex. And if you do something like this mapping of tones, you see again something like a somatotopy, what we had before, but here it's called tonotopy because it's not based on our body parts, but on the tones, on different frequencies of tones. And here this part which is um, encircled by this black line that should label you Heschel's gyrus. This is what we just saw on the picture before. All right. Now, we go back to the central sulcus region. This was just an ex excursion because it's looking like this hand knob. It's called the hand knob, the other thing. But we, I would like to show you that the central sulcus region contains a little more information, actually, based on these landmarks. Let's come back to the top view of the brain. Here, you now are very familiar with it. Here would be the central sulcus. This guy, here is the hand region on both sides. And now we are focusing on another sulcus which comes in from the front. And if you take a look here on the surface, you see that here is the frontal lobe, and here is a very, very long and large sulcus on both sides. And you see, hopefully, that it goes into this sulcus over here. This one meeting this sulcus over here. And this is why it's called the T sign, like a T sitting on top, this is the superior frontal sulcus on both sides, meeting, here on the left side it's actually not that well visible, but on the right side I hope you can, uh, I can convince you that it's looking like that. This is the precentral sulcus. So the superior frontal sulcus meets the precentral sulcus always in a T-like shape. And you can actually see that as well on a brain section, not only on the surface, here you see a, an axial view again, a transversal brain section through the top of the brain, and here you nicely cut through the superior frontal sulcus, which meets here with the precentral sulcus. So again, a hint for you where you are in terms of the larger central sulcus region, because here you would have then the precentral gyrus, and here would be the central sulcus then. There it is. Just to sum this part a little up, people have found that it's not only those landmarks that are already showed you within the central sulcus region, but even more, which you can always find, always, we are in biology here, always not meaning 100%, but let's say in about 70 to 100%, depending on the subject. And this is a little in flat view, so not all of those signs are visible in every brain section, so you have to go through the brain sections to see them all. But some of them you can already identify, hopefully. For example, here, number one, you see again the T sign, for example, that we just discussed. You see here, number eight, the central sulcus going all the way from the lateral surface to the mesial site. And here, it meets directly neighboring the marginal branch of the cingulate sulcus again. That was what we saw a little, some slides before. And here it's called like another sign because if you take a look on these transversal brain sections, you can see that they form something like a bracket or a mustache. And that's why it's called the mustache sign. Yeah, like this. The mustache sign. And what you can now also see is that if those are neighboring guys, you see here the post-central gyrus, central sulcus, post-central gyrus, which somehow surrounds this marginal branch of the cingulate sulcus. And this is called why it's called the Y sign, because like the letter Y, it um, surrounds here the marginal branch. Another hint would be actually to compare to the two gyri around the central sulcus. Typically, the post-central gyrus is thinner as compared to the pre-central gyrus, which you can see here. Typically because the cortex of the motor system is a little larger, and thus the bending is a little wider, and that is the reason why the pre-central gyrus looks thicker than the post-central gyrus over here. <laughs> 
Here the number 10, you already know, that's the omega sign, our hand knob. And then you have some other signs as well, which are, uh, some of them are nicely visible in brain sections, some are really complicated to identify. This L sign here, it's called the L sign, is actually quite well visible because you can now see, similar to this T sign, where the superior frontal sulcus meets the precentral sulcus, here it's the same for the gyri. The superior frontal gyrus meets with the precentral gyrus, and that's why it's called the L sign, and sometimes it's only in one of, uh, of the images, on one of the slices through the brain, sometimes you see it, depending on the individual anatomy, on two or three slices. This one I just left out for today. This is some hints on Broca's region, on the speech region of the brain. So it's also quite easy to identify this region based on the macroanatomy because you see here this so-called M sign where you have the different parts of the inferior frontal gyrus which are labeled by this M, via this M. The middle part is the easiest way. It looks like a triangle, so it's called the triangular part. Then you have the opercular part here on the back, and on the very front it would be the orbital part going to the orbitofrontal cortex in the direction of the orbitofrontal cortex. The number nine, just to make it complete, is the U sign, but the U sign is actually typically not that well visible, so I just leave it out for today. And all these landmarks are not only important for you to identify functional regions within the brain, but you also have already a hint on fiber tracts. For example, in this case, obviously, our central sulcus region gives rise to one of our most prominent fiber tracts, the pyramidal tract. And uh, this is a nice uh, reconstruction of that via diffusion imaging from the Human Connectome Project. And we take a look from the front. So here would be the front, here would be the back. And here would be the motor cortex that we just saw. And here the fibers coming out forming the pyramidal tract, which goes down here through the brainstem and then all the way down to the spinal cord. You can also see that there are quite some transcalosal fibers going from left to right, obviously. And all of that you know when you nicely and precisely identify the central sulcus. Then you know at least approximately where you start with your pyramidal tract. It's actually easier to see if you put a brain onto it. Um, this is, again, a view from the front. Here you see parts of the pyramidal tract starting in here and going down. And now we're coming back to our landmarks. You compare this guy with this picture down here. Both of them belong to the pyramidal tract. But the upper part here, if you remember our homunculus, the upper part depicts those fibers which are responsible for our foot, leg, and body region. Maybe parts of it already for our hand region because on the lateral side we had the hand knob where we would connect then our hand region information. And finally, these here on the very lateral aspect, that would be the representations of our face and mouth region. So you can easily depict different parts of this large tract via knowing these somatotopic organizations on the surface. As a second example of today, I would like to show you a little about landmarks within the visual system because they are also quite nicely visible and they help you to identify at least parts of the important regions that we have there. Here we have to start from the mesial side again. This is almost the me complete mesial view. You see here a very large sulcus in the back of the brain. Here would be, you remember, here is the central sulcus, at least a little part of it. And here we have a large sulcus. It's called the parieto-occipital sulcus because it is somehow separating parietal and occipital lobe. And the most important sulcus that we always want to identify would be this guy, which is almost in a 90-degree um, angle standing on the parieto-occipital sulcus. This one here, this is the calcarine sulcus. Calcarine sulcus for our visual system, for our primary visual cortex, very important. And also this one is visible on different sections through the brain. You do not need a surface reconstruction to see it. 
You can easily identify it actually on coronal brain sections. This is a coronal one through the back of the brain. And the sulcus, which the only sulcus, if you compare it to all the others surrounding it, the only sulcus on the mesial surface, here's the mesial part, going very deep into the brain, perpendicular, deep into the brain, would be the, sing, uh, the um, calcarine sulcus, this one. And if you now go to a transversal brain section, here would be the front, here the back, you have another hint, it's called the broken M sign. Maybe you already have an idea of where it might be located. It's down here. And if I put it in, I hope you can at least follow my argumentation. It's the so-called broken M sign. Why? Because if you have the interhemispheric fissure, it separates obviously left and right um, calcarine sulcus. And the reason why it's forming such an M letter is that typically the calcarine sulcus is not only going deep into the white matter, but also tries to build to, to branch within the white matter and builds these, these large branches in here. So that's the reason why it's not going only perpendicular in, but has a little bottom of it. Not, not like the typical small bottom of a sulcus, but a very enlarged uh, bottom part. That is called the, why it's called the broken M sign. And you can also identify it a little better on coronal sections, but in a more rostral view. We were quite, quite caudal in these sections. If you go a little bit more rostral, you can see a very peculiar sign, I think. Here it's already called the X sign, and I hope you can see it, something like this. Here it's something like an X. And this X gives you these two sulci that we just identified on uh, the first visual system image. This shows you on the top, from here from left, from right, the parieto occipital sulcus again, which meets with the calcarine sulcus. And if they do, they form this X-like structure. And if you have this X-like structure, you already know that you have these very large sulci within the occipital parieto transition zone. So the X sign. Why it's important? Again, the functional side of it. If we know the, where the calcarine sulcus is, we know already a lot about our visual system. Imagine this being our visual field, a nice view on Paris. And it is easier, at least to, in functional imaging, to categorize the different parts of the visual field, for example, by coloring them, like from green to lighter green, yellow, red, and blue. And there you have the different parts of the visual system which you can nicely map. We already heard about the somatotopy and the tonotopy. And this is a similar principle called retinotopy because the different parts of our retina where the visual field is represented are nicely mapped and all the different locations are kept until they are projected to the brain. And if you now help a little further, you can parcelate it into so-called quadrants. And then you have, for example, here, a left upper quadrant, a left lower quadrant, and so on. Why I'm showing you this? Because the mapping is similar to our somatotopic or tonotopic mapping onto the cortex. If you do it in a functional imaging study, you can nicely see the different colors here. Somehow in a very organized fashion, we are looking now from the mesial side again onto the occipital lobe, and right here in the middle, where the green part moves from down here, the green part moves over to the yellow and red parts. Right here in the middle would be the calcarine sulcus that we just identified. So if you have that, if you know where the, central, the calcarine sulcus is, you already have a hint which parts of the visual field might be located above or below the calcarine sulcus. Obviously, the calcarine sulcus is part of it because cortex within the calcarine sulcus is the most important for our primary visual system. But the surrounding parts of the visual system, not only primary, V1, but also secondary and tertiary visual cortex, contain different parts of our visual field. And if you have a hint on where the calcarine sulcus is, you already have at least a separation into upper and lower part. And the funny thing is that this is really showing you, not only in a very abstract, colorful fashion, but it's really showing you how our visual field is represented on the brain. This is Sir Isaac Newton, and the way Sir Isaac Newton looks on our brain would be like this. Yeah? 
This is a little deformed. It's upside down, obviously, and the central part of our visual system is represented here on the very hind part of the occipital lobe. Then would be here the, the calcarine sulcus, and all the rest of the visual field is somehow arranged around it. And showing you again a depiction or an example of the fibers which belong to it, this would be the most important large fiber tract going into the visual cortex. We are looking from the bottom of the brain. Here would be the frontal lobe, and here are parts of the temporal and occipital lobe a little ripped off. Why? Because we would like to see this large fiber tract here inside the white matter of the brain, and here it goes all the way to the occipital lobe. This is the so-called optic radiation, bringing information from the lateral geniculate body in the thalamus region all the way to the occipital cortex. And again, our calcarine sulcus helps us to identify parts of these fibers. Why? Because you can... This is a real live post-mortem dissection. This is the same one reconstructed in diffusion imaging, so you definitely can see this fiber tract of this optic radiation. You see, for example, a dorsal, the, the brownish color, and a ventral segment, the blue color, and these two segments just end above or below the calcarine sulcus. So if you have the calcarine sulcus, you already know that you are in the upper or the lower part of the optic radiation, for example. It actually shows you also that not only all parts, at least in what the people in this study found, is that not all parts of the optic radiation go directly into primary visual cortex, but some of them might also go into the next, the secondary and tertiary visual cortex, and that is showing you just that there are additional uh, sub subsegments of this optic, optic radiation. And if you have the calcarine sulcus, you know that within the calcarine sulcus you have the primary visual cortex, and directly adjacent to it would be the secondary V2 or the tertiary V3 cortex. And some of the segments go immediately right next to the, central, to the um, calcarine sulcus. And as a last example of that, there are also other fiber tracts, obviously. Something is going in into the visual cortex. That would be easy. But obviously, something should, be go out, should go out again. And these are very important and long fiber tracts, very large ones, which are directly adjacent to the optic radiation. And that's why they are very close together. If you imagine the occipital lobe, it's quite small, not a lot of white matter. They are very close together. And these two guys are the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, starting here. In the back, here is the occipital cortex. And the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, one of them is going to the frontal parts, and one of them is going to the temporal cortex. And you see, if you just take a look at the starting points, they are very close together. And the same is true. We saw that on the picture before here. The same is true here for the optic radiation. So all of these fiber tracts in the occipital lobe are very close. So if you have an idea of where the calcarine sulcus is, where the surrounding parts of the cortex are, you can at least imagine of where the optic radiation st should start and where fibers just a little lateral to it should emerge because those guys here typically st not start from the primary visual but from secondary or tertiary visual cortices. And you can also see those ones actually on 3D reconstructions of the fiber tracts. Here would be the back, here would be the front, here's our pyramidal tract again that we just saw a few slides before. And here you see that they are very close together. Here is the inferior frontooccipital fasciculus, this long one here, the green one, and the other green one here in a little back to it is the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. So very close together. And as a last example of the visual system, we also see landmarks actually which are quite tiny. The ones that I showed you in the last slides are very, very prominent. And most of you would say like, okay, yeah, I, I heard about those maybe a little bit at least. This one is a quite recent landmark, and it's a very tiny one. We are still in the occipital lobe. Here, again, a coronal section. And please take a look at this part down here. So the ventral aspect here would be the calcarine sulcus again. And here is the ventral aspect of our visual system. So we are somewhere in, in between the occipital and beginning of the temporal cortex. And 
if you reconstruct this region, we are looking at this particular part here. And if you focus on this gyrus, you would say like, well, it's a gyrus, that's it. But be careful, there is something in here. Obviously there are some large sulci, this one here, this one here, and this is a very tiny one, more like a dimple, not really a sulcus. But uh, interestingly, this is the important one. If you try to identify it, it's the so-called mid-fusiform sulcus because it's located within the fusiform gyrus. And if you try to locate it here within this fusiform gyrus, this is the guy over here, you can barely see it because the reconstruction is so, so um, shallow, this sulcus. But why it's interesting? Because if you do functional imaging as well as some mapping, and that is what the next talk will show you, you can nicely see that this mid-fusiform sulcus identifies you a separation between very important cytoarchitectonic microstructural areas here on the left side and some functional regions on the right side. Our fusiform cortex does a lot of functional visual stuff, but in this example, it's about the face region, the fusiform face area. And these guys over here, the red ones, some of them should be parts of the face region, and what you can definitely see is all of them are located to the lateral side of this mid-fusiform sulcus. On the mesial side, no face region at all. So for ending up my talk, I hope I could convince you that there are some landmarks. Definitely, there are some landmarks in different parts of the brain, and they help us to identify functional units. But now, I just showed you visual system examples, central sulcus region examples. And the problem is, these are very large ones. What about all the rest of the cortex over here? We didn't talk about it. And maybe we need a little more than just looking at our macroanatomy. And that is how I would like to leave you with. And uh, it should already give you a hint on the next talk where we go a little further down into the details of the brain. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for now?